Um, is Sarah hey, Sarah. here? Hey, Sarah. Ah, hello, Sarah. Hello. <laughs> Hi, all. Thanks very much hey. for joining us. Hi. Okay. Still more people joining us, Owen? Yeah, probably just give it another minute or two. Just let last people get in. Pretty cool. Yeah, well, that's everyone in the waiting room, so I'll let more people in as they come. All right, Kim, over to okay. you. Okay, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all to the last meeting of the year for our LCR APPG. Uh, what a year it's been, particularly for our health and care services, and we know that with the onset of Omicron, it's likely to increase further. And for those who attended our meeting in November, you'll know that we had a really constructive and informative meeting um, with a keynote address from Minister Gillian Keegan. And we did follow up that meeting with a letter to Gillian, um, but we've not had um, a response yet, but you will have received a copy with your joining instructions. But today's theme of the meeting is about levelling up with a focus on race inequalities in the city region. And I'm really delighted that Sarah Atkinson, the CEO of the Social Mobility Foundation, is presenting today. And colleagues from the combined authority, including Lorna Rogers and Steve Rotherham, and two young people, Ravimbo and Leah. Um, we also have two business items that we need to discuss and agree today. And Steve from the Secretariat will propose a provisional programme for 2022. But we also need to agree the APPG's representative on the board for the Liverpool Freeport. So what is levelling up, you know, other than a strap line that we hear every single day? You know, and the PM has used the term since he took office, but it has a different meaning to different people. But what we do know is COVID has widened the economic divide with half of UK families now £110 worse off a year since 2019. But the richest 5% are better off by 3,300. And this clearly is not levelling up. And as we know, the proposed levelling up white paper has been kicked into the grass, but it's now expected in January. But I'd like to start the session by introducing Sarah Atkinson, the CEO of the Social Mobility Foundation, um, who will be discussing levelling up inequalities, a national perspective. So, Sarah, please give us your perspective on how you think levelling up can become a force for good and deliver real change. Thanks, over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for having me, uh, everyone. It's a real privilege to be joining you today um, and to be able to talk a bit about our perspective from the Social Mobility Foundation, and what we're seeing and experiencing and what we think needs to happen. For those of you who don't know the Social Mobility Foundation, we're a national charity that works directly with 7,000 young people each year to help them get opportunities for work experience, uh, a mentor, support, uh, access to universities and employers to build their skills and their knowledge. Uh, we work with a disadvantaged group of young people. Most of our students are on free school meals. They're the first generation to go to university. Um, and through the support that we offer, they're able to access top universities, top employers. We also run the Social Mobility Employers Index and we advocate and campaign for awareness and action on, on social mobility. We've had a base in the Liverpool city region since 2018. Uh, we're currently supporting almost 500 young people in year 13 and at university and in January we'll enrol a new year 12 cohort of about 120 students from Liverpool City and within an hour's travel of the city of Liverpool. And we, we chose to have a base in, in Liverpool as part of our 
uh, network of hubs across the country because uh, in 2017, when, when we began scoping opening the office, Liverpool was ranked 274th out of the 324 lower tier local authorities in England um, for social mobility. So that's for opportunities for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds to achieve their potential to make change. Um, it, it, the city, as you will all know, you know, has got some of the most deprived neighbourhoods in the country. Just over a third of disadvantaged pupils get their A to C grades in maths and English. Um, and I won't talk to this group about issues like the kind of school's performance in Knowsley, which you will know well, and some of the, the trickier areas and challenges for young people. So we chose Liverpool as one of our key bases to support young people. But we've got a perspective right across the country. And I wanted to share with you some of the reflections that we have from supporting disadvantaged young people over the last 15 years and particularly over the last 20 months through the pandemic. Um, and there's no doubt for those of us who work on a increasing equality and, and closing the inequality gap, the landscape is looking pretty bleak. Before the pandemic, social mobility had stagnated for a decade. The attainment gap between children from the lowest income families and their privileged peers was six months by the age of five, 18 months by the age of 16. If you were better off, you were nearly 80% more likely to end up in a professional job than if you come from a working class background. And even when people from disadvantaged backgrounds were landing a professional job, they were earning 17% less than their colleagues from a privileged background. So we came into the pandemic with these deep inequities in our society, which the pandemic has both exposed and made worse. Every economic crisis tends to increase inequality. The pandemic has seemed particularly cruelly designed to target the poorest and to target young people. More than half of them to 25s have been furloughed or lost their jobs last June. We've got a million uh, unemployed people under 25. The impact of learning loss from school disruption was directly correlated to poverty and low performance. If you were at a, a low performing school in a poor area of the country, the impact of learning loss was significantly worse. The attainment gap that I talked about between poorest students and their peers has widened as the same time as the number of children eligible for free school meals has increased. So we go into 2022 with more children poor and the outcomes for poor children having got worse. Despite the headlines that, that you'll be familiar with from this summer's assessments about grades being up across the board, it wasn't a rising tide that lifted all boats. That record number of high grades was disproportionately awarded to private schools and in London and the South East. And young people taking vocational qualifications did not see a grade increase. We work directly with disadvantaged young people and we see the profound impact firsthand that this is having. The, the anxiety about the uncertainty about their exams, assessments, job prospects, university admissions, the difficulty they are having in getting resources to study, opportunities to get work experience or to benefit from enrichment activities and the real deep concern about the extent to which there's an agenda to make a difference or whether everybody has just got used to living with the fact that when you where you grow up and your family background define your chances there are some things that we see that are positive opportunities um, public awareness of this inequality has, has never been higher. The Social Mobility Commission, which now sits in the Cabinet Office, tracks public awareness and public expectations through an annual barometer. And it shows growing public awareness of the extent of inequality and growing public expectation that government and business needs to do something about it. That is a government and business responsibility. We work directly with employers to influence them to take action. And, and we've seen some positive movement from the business community. We had a record 203 employers enter our social mobility index this year, 
uh, showing their willingness to, to benchmark their efforts and improve and from a much broader range of sectors. Um, we even had Everton Football Club join the index this year. So I'm hoping the competitive spirit will mean we get Liverpool as well next year. Um, so we've been able to share some really good examples of employers who've created new resources for schools, increased their outreach and offered some really good routes into the employer for school leavers, for apprentices, as well as for graduates. Now, employers are acting on this partly because of that awareness of inequality, but it's, they're also acting on it because it's very practical. They can see that at the moment, the education recovery plan from government is focused on academic basics and on tutoring. And this means that workplace skills, careers advice and opportunity, which was already inadequate in many schools before the pandemic because of lack of resources, is gonna be even more squeezed. Charities like ours who are offering free quality opportunities, we can't get into schools because tutor time has been given over to academic catch up. So our free brilliant programme can't get to as all the young people who would benefit from it. So educators and employers have got to work together to bridge that gap and make sure that young people are, are developing the skills that business needs and they deserve to be able to achieve their potential. I know you're talking today about race inequality as well as social class inequality and I did want to share a worry from our work that we're seeing that these are increasingly likely to be pitted against each other. We already hear employers saying it's hard to make the case for worrying about social class disadvantage when there's so much work to do on race disadvantage and we see an agenda that argues that support for black young people to achieve their education and career potential has to come at the expense of white working class young people as though it's a sort of zero sum game. The young people we work with know perfectly well that race inequality and class inequality both exist and are closely intertwined. They know perfectly well who is hoarding all the advantages and that they're not the fault of their peers from different, different ethnic backgrounds is not the fault of why they don't have the opportunities they deserve. Working class communities and minoritized ethnic communities overlap and they always have done. And so it would be facile to claim that you know, one action plan can solve these complex deep rooted problems, but there is overlap in the change we need to make. There needs to be overlap in the, in the problem solving and the solutions. So I'll just finish with by saying social mobility is a huge deep rooted problem, not one we can fix with one intervention or in one parliament. But there's really good evidence about the things that work. Investment in early years, targeted pupil premium funding to create opportunities for disadvantaged young people, mentoring programmes can be transformational, uh, activities to engage and inspire young people in the potential they have, and a relentless focus on making sure that every effort is targeted and the impact is measured on how much difference it is making for the young people in the communities that have least and are left behind. The hard part of levelling up inequalities is not knowing what to do. It's harnessing the political will and determination to make sure we stop accepting these inequalities as normal part of our society and we really put a laser-like focus on the change. And that is what I wanted to share with you to kick off your discussion this afternoon. Sarah, thanks. So can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for the presentation. I think, you know, you've provided some uh, alarming statistics, but you also um, raised some really important points about um, race and social class and the fact that, you know, levelling up um, is unlikely to achieve the objectives that this um, government uh, uh, thinking that they can do. And so what I would say now, um, everybody, if there's an opportunity to um, raise questions with Sarah about her presentation. And so if anybody would like to um, ask a question, can you, you please use the raised hand function or to um, put it in the chat box, please? 
And Steve, if you can see people um, who would like to speak, please let me know because I can't see everybody. Okay, I know Steve Coffey's put something in the chat. Hmm. Um, can't see any hands going up at the moment. Steve Coffey, then would you like to ask um, Sarah a question then, please? Uh, only that the only comment I, I, I made in the chat there is that, you know, from a housing perspective, which is where we're coming from fundamentally, obviously giving someone a decent home and a decent place to live and environment is, the is, sorry for the pun, the foundation for the rest of their lives. And people are going to mm -hmm. be healthier, the kids are going to be better at school, all of those things mm -hmm. that get, get people on. But what's the point of giving someone a lovely home to enjoy their abject poverty in? So mm -hmm. it is all this other stuff that actually yeah. changes people's lives using the home as a foundation. And that's very much where we're coming from. And the resources we invest with the Taurus Foundation, who does lots of the work that Sarah was mentioning too, is a key focus for us to actually go beyond just the basics of being a landlord. And thanks for that, Steve, because, you know, the height of the pandemic when um, children were learning from home or some of those that could, I think, you know, having the space within the home was very key and crucial. Well, you know, and we know that a lot of children um, within um, some of our communities didn't have the luxury of, you know, um, a bedroom or a quiet space to, to do their work, you know, despite the fact that they were also suffering digital poverty as well. And I think all of those things impact because I think, um, Sarah, you, you raised the point about the widening of the education attainment gap, you know, and COVID is going to have a significant impact going forward because, you know, it was widening. It's going to get worse now because of the amount of learning loss that you alluded to before. But because no one else has asked a question, I'll ask a question if that's OK. Robbie, I'll bring you in as well in a moment. But you mentioned, um, Sarah, about the 500 cohort that you're supporting. But I just wanted to know whether those young people that you support are tracked just to find out, you know, what happens to them beyond university. Because I think it's one thing you know, going to university, but it's about, you know, um, what jobs they get in the job market, you know, what promotions and stuff. So but I'd be really interested for you to maybe respond to that, please, um, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Kim. And, and we absolutely do. I, I couldn't agree more. We, uh, when we started our work 15 years ago, we were working on getting young, young people into university. We, we know all too well that that is, you know, that's not the end of the story. Um, by a long shot. We now support young people through universities or graduate apprenticeships or their kind of opportunities and we track their career outcomes long term um, because we know that that's completing the journey is is the challenge and being being supported by us to be able to complete that journey into work mm -hmm. which is so important not just for the individual young person that we're supporting and working with but for their their family their wider network the role models that our students can be to the cohort that comes behind them is really important because it, it changes their view of what's possible for them because they see people, young people like them going on to achieve their potential. Um, but the cohort impact is really important as well when it comes to the, the, the learning loss. You know, one of the most brutal things that's happened over the last couple of years is our students have seen have not been able to achieve what they're capable of because mm -hmm. of the, the the resources and the mm -hmm. assessments challenge mm -hmm. and that's we we can see that damaging the the, the aspiration uh, mm -hmm. and the enthusiasm of the cohort that comes behind them because they feel like it's just too hard mm -hmm. um, and that is heartbreaking to see and and so you're right Kim to pick out you know some of the practical resources mm -hmm. to make it possible for young people we ask them to work so hard and do so much we have to give them the support to make it possible for them to keep being resilient thank so you that cohort impact is so important thanks um sarah we have now a couple of people who will ask questions so i've got robbie tim and then mo so over to you first robbie by the way, just to, um, thanks for that, Kim. Um, Sarah, sort of, I was interested to say uh, that you said public awareness of inequalities has never been higher, yeah? In the research you've done, um, have you researched what people are saying in terms of that view with regard to solutions for dealing with the inequalities? 
Yeah, Robbie, that's a great question. So it's the Social Mobility Commission that, that tracks this. Um, there's, a, there's an annual barometer that they run of public attitudes, both to their own opportunities and to how fair they think the country is and who they think should do something about it. Um, so there's not, a, there's not questions about the sort of detail of that, but one of the changes over the last couple of years is that expectation on government to do something has grown a little bit. It's always been high and it's grown. Expectation of business to do something has grown a lot. And I think there's really something from a, from a government and politics agenda, there's really something important about harnessing that expectation of business, but also that willingness that we see of business. It doesn't seem to me that that's being harnessed. There are things that government is doing that are government, and there are things that business is doing as business. But I would really like to see more harnessing of that, how things could work together, particularly, as I said in my presentation on um, careers and skills resources as we do catch up. We need, a, we need a careers and skills catch up, just like we need an academic catch up. And, and business is already doing stuff on this that should be harnessed and driven, in my view, which would meet that public expectation, as well as, you know, frankly, being of practical use to the young people that we work with. Thanks, Sarah. Tim? Thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, so I was just going to ask, um, related to young people, and obviously uh, in the pand pandemic, especially the, the access to certain certain young people from from uh, you know underprivileged backgrounds um, has been severely stretched, and that's been exacerbated by you know understaffed and underfunded um, child services. Uh, how how do you think that barrier? You know, what can we do in the short term to sort of make this less of an uphill battle um given how yeah given how stretched all these services are and and you know i know you work for a charity um do you think there's anything that different you know sectors of the of society can do to, to help in this respect yeah I, it's really heartbreaking tim i mean i described the challenges we're having in in getting our opportunities to the young people who we know need them and would have benefit from them but the the pressure on capacity in schools is, is just you know it's downward and downward and downward and that's the same experience that a lot of charities running all sorts of opportunities sporting music enrichment activities of all kinds have found um i mean it seems to me and i'm not a you know i'm not a politician i'm not a policy person but it seems to us that one of the key things is is coordinating between coordinating better between all the resources and opportunities that are available from charities like mine and the young people that need them it shouldn't be so hard we shouldn't be asking individual schools to find time to let us come and make a presentation it should be easier to connect the need to the offer than it is and I think connected to that we really need to harness the volunteering potential that we have you know one of the most transformative things we offer in our program is a one-to-one -one mentor for all the young people with a professional volunteer who through the pandemic was often the only adult outside of their family they were having any kind of conversations with but it was so valuable to their mental health to their connection to their ability to see beyond what was happening to them right now um, there is huge benefit from from that volunteering opportunity and a mentor can be transformative to young people but again we need to harness what's the the availability and the willingness of volunteers to connect better so a lot of this is about connection um and and the kind of network working better i think thank you sarah and finally mo yeah thanks kim um a couple of things from, from my side, and they're probably quite late, to be honest. Obviously, firstly, we're, we're proud to become the first and, and only kind of football club to um, participate in the social um, kind of mobility employer index. Um, I think we, there's probably a role for us to play, to be honest, and we're keen to play that in terms of how we, we can encourage other sporting organisations and specifically kind of football clubs to to kind of begin to play their part as well. But what was, what's been kind of evident from kind of our side is, is obviously we, we talked earlier on about how public awareness has, has probably never been higher, but actually trying to get the media to report on the, the good sides of, of, um, of, of what's taking place and what's happening is really, really difficult. And, and there's a, a, a probably 
a, a desire more to focus. I appreciate it's, it's happened right across the board, but a, a desire to focus on the negative elements of, of what's happened as opposed to maybe some of the positive elements. And I'm, I suppose that the question I'm asking is, is what can we do to begin to highlight some of the, the positive things that are happening and how we can begin to encourage even more positive behaviour? Mo, thank you. That's such a, a great question. And, and thank you again for to, to you and all at Everton for your leadership on this. And I think I think there are, yeah, there are two things that come to mind. One is leadership. One is organisations with standing in the community, nationally or locally, t taking a stand and leading visibly. And I think that's really important because it encourages others to feel like they can, they should. You know, there's something to join. I think the other is it's really important to show hope. And I said in my presentation, it's not that we don't, this isn't inevitable. You know, we've, we've lived with these gaps for so long, we've stopped noticing them sometimes, but actually it's not inevitable. There are things that work that we can do, sharing those stories of the things that work. The young people who are studying on a smartphone have won a place at, at a university and are, and are going the projects that young people have worked on the kind of transformative opportunities and sharing those as stories of hope hopeful stories and also stories of evidence that it's not if we can do more of this more good things will happen it it really is as straightforward as that but i think you're right i think there's a real danger that the stories we tell are of the inevitable awfulness and not of the, the, the learning from the hope. So we work really hard to make sure that we're sharing the stories of the, the brilliant things our young people achieve, that we always talk about that it's their achievement, not ours, but that through the things we've offered them, that's been unlocked. And it's, if we could do more, then we would achieve more. It's as simple as that. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your presentation and for the contributions from our participants. We're going to move on to the next section of our meeting now, which will be a panel of speakers on levelling up inequalities and progress in the city region. First two speakers are two young people um, and hopefully going to speak for um, very briefly. So I'm going to call in Ravimbo first, if that's possible. Thank you. Hi. Hi everyone, how are you all doing? Um, so I'm Ravim Bomla Nawafa and I'm 27 years old and I was born in Zimbabwe but raised in Liverpool and I'm a multidisciplinary artist, I act, I write, I model and I dance um, but I also was one of the Generations for Change um, producers that was hired to document the lived experiences of young being people within the rural. Um, and through these six months, I was able to sit down with seven young people and they were able to sit down and share their stories with me. And what I found within the Wirral um, was quite sad because it was really difficult to connect with these young people anyways. Um, because for the first two months of the six months, it was trying to find organizations that worked with the young being people, um, whether this was organizations that dealt with mental health or um, had facilities that allowed young people to explore their creativity. And I found that because also of the pandemic, because of the pandemic, it was difficult to reach out and connect with these people because even when I did connect with the young people, they were not comfortable um, enough to share their stories. Um, the reason being that they felt like they were not heard for such a long time that when someone did try and approach them to tell their stories and give them the opportunity to be a part of possibly being a part of positive change, they were not really forthcoming because there's a lack of trust as well in governmental officials or people within authoritative positions of power because they feel that for so long they've been unheard, there's no point. Um, I also found out that there's a lack of resources and facilities for young people that are centered upon being people and the illnesses and the health issues that they might experience. Um, and I also found that because also with organizations I would contact, most of the organizations were white led and I found that a lot of the young people that I did end up speaking to among the seven found it very difficult to approach these organizations because you're most likely to talk to someone that looks like you and understands your experience because lived experience is the best teacher. And a lot of the young people felt that 
when they do connect with these white led organizations, they don't feel heard because they don't understand exactly what they're going through. Um, for example, whether it's, um, and then I also found that the environment that these young people were growing in or being raised in um, was making it very difficult for them to be themselves and express themselves because a lot of the young people were experiencing racial slurs or they were experiencing a lot of um, they were experiencing a lot of just I'm, I'm reflecting on it but they're experiencing a lot of um, a lot of trauma a lot of there's a lot of trauma that's not being dealt with and they find it very difficult to just approach people to speak to them um, because even though they wear services that are there to to help them they just feel that their perspectives are not being taken seriously because they don't see that change happening quick enough and i found out within the ribble the areas that these children were raised in was quite deprived the opportunities you might find in liverpool you can't find within the rural um and lastly i think one of the biggest takeaways was it takes a village to raise a child and it's all about the mindset of the people that they are surrounded by because with simple things like whether it's someone not making or taking the time to learn your name or understand who you are they felt as though because of that they were not able to to function or completely progress in society. Um, so I think one of the takeaways that I found was that they wanted people to understand that it's our responsibility also as individuals to change our mindset and to open our minds in order to understand them so they can also believe in themselves. Ravimba, can I just say thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences and identify some of the problems and the challenges faced by young black people on the Wirral. And hopefully there are people on the call today can take that on board and start instigating some change. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to call in now Leah, who is the chair of Halton Young Youth Cabinet. So um, Leah, please. Hi, thank you, Kim. Um... I'm Leah and I'm from Holton. Um, I'm currently 17 and doing my A-levels. Um, and I can only echo um, the educational inequalities that we've heard and definitely the access to services um, issues that have been um, raised previously. Especially from race and so fast point of view, hard and scrapped and split into um, funding um, pots um, to ensure that there was some services there and that has obviously caused a really big issue within coordination of young people and being able to recover some of the groups that we used to have and especially some of the services interaction with schools who were already facing issues with you know some of the mental health um, problems that we're seeing we're seeing it described as a mental health epidemic and it's only been worsened um, by the pandemic um, and not having that extra support from the youth services within schools um, has definitely caused an extra bit of pressure. Um, I've previously worked with Youth Access, who does a national campaign called Fund the Hubs that calls upon the government um, to fund hubs within a couple of mile radius of young people in every area of the country um, to allow for them to have access to some informal mental health services. And this is something that I've definitely supported and have been, you know, enjoyed being a part of because a huge issue at the moment is is that lack of aspiration and also that um, lack of access to education sometimes because of the mental health issues that we're seeing at the moment um, and a vast amount of bereavement um, to the point where either, you know, I've got friends at the moment who have um, been forced out of college because they were not able to deal with their mental health issues and therefore not able to continue on their education and therefore have been pushed back and unable to attain what they're capable of attaining and um, which is a big problem I think that um, a lot of the the youth service um, is a bit mismatched across the areas and I think that we could really benefit um, from youth provisions being guaranteed in all areas um, because I think every area should have a youth service of a good standard to allow 
because I agree with what um, you know was previously said. It takes a, vis a village to raise a child, and I think that you do if you don't have that community aspect, um, it's going to feel really isolating, especially when you're in marginalised groups. Um, to to also you know just you know generally, but also edge that's a massive problem. Um, and I think that would definitely improve young people's lives if they had that. But I also think just previous, going on to the previous point it's about a lot of the foundation from into universities, into apprenticeships is a lot of it is targeted at who gained all seven separated within colleges um, and that often leaves a lot of young people that are you know really capable of um you know much better things um that are not um sort of i guess a big issue over the past two years um, and i think that a lot more programs to work with young people as a whole rather than full. And I guess that's been my key takeaways from some of the inequalities that I've seen. Thank you so much, Leah. And sadly, you, um, you kept on cutting out a bit through, through that um, um, discussion, sadly. But you, and you, you did raise some really important points about the impact of COVID on mental health and the fact that services are um, not as available as, as they should be. And the fact that mental health services have crumbled um, under the last 20 months. And I think, you know, again, we need to be looking at how um, young people are supported better in terms of um, those services. So thank you again for your contribution. I'm going to move on now to introducing Lorna Rogers, who is the Director of Mayoral Programme Delivery for the Liverpool City Region. So over to you. Thank you, Lorna. Thanks, Kim. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for, for giving us this time to talk um, about the progress that we've been making on the race equality programme for the region, which is kind of our kind of approach to levelling up on the inequalities for our black, Asian and minority ethnic residents. So I've got a couple of slides that I'm going to take people through. Um, and I'm obviously happy to, to take questions when, when I've reached the end. So I just kind of reflected on the last time I came to talk to you in October 2020, um, where we were still kind of gathering evidence for our business case around what, what the work we needed to do in shaping this race equality programme to kind of tackle the systemic injustice and inequalities that we know have persisted for decades. Um, if you just go to the next slide, please, Owen. And we, we agreed that we'd structure the programme across three three different areas of work. So us as an employer as the combined authority and getting our own house in order. We've not got a diverse workforce and we've got work to do there. Us as a commissioner in terms of what we invest, the services that we deliver and the services that we commission to be delivered in the region and making sure that they can benefit and are accessible to our Black, Asian and minority ethnic residents and businesses. And then us as a facilitator in terms of amplifying the voices of our communities and working with other institutions and organisations to take some positive action on addressing the inequalities um, that exist. So I'm going to give a bit of an overview of some of the achievements that we, we've done in the past year. Go to the next slide, please. So we talked last time about having a commitment and we've, we've established a declaration of intent, which was approved in March this year by the combined authority. And this sets out a number of targets, tangible things that we need to do and that we've signed up to achieve in areas such as business support and um, diversity of our apprenticeships and employment targets for us as an employer. So we've committed to reporting on this annually and letting people know how we're, how we're delivering against them targets that have been set. And I think that was important that we made that public commitment to something tangible. We did some engagement work with over 300 people um, during our kinds of evidence gathering phase, mainly focusing on employment and what the barriers were and what people's experiences had been and also what they wanted to see change. So that was kind of us starting to co-design some of the solutions that we need to put in place because we've got a real focus on reducing the kind of employment gap and the economic disparities. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So all of this work accumulated into a business case, which we took to the combined authority in July um, for investment. 
So we've secured £3.6 million worth of funding for us to develop a number of race equality interventions. Major part of that is, is ring fence for the race equality hub, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail on the next slide. Um, but there's also things such as training for our local authority staff. So all 22,000 staff in the region will get racial literacy training as part of this investment. Um, we've also invested in the Generations for Change and you heard Ravimba's story and you know, they did some excellent work on, on amplifying the voices of their peers. And I think it's really important that we get this feedback from young people because it's their future and they need to be part of creating these solutions. So, you know, we, we had six young people for six months um, going out and finding out this feedback and that will be hopefully informing the work that we need to do and shaping the solutions going forward. So thanks for Rinda to, for joining us today as well and sharing her, her story. We've also um, agreed to participate in a national art education program called the World Reimagined. So people may remember the Superland Bananas of 2008. Um, it's a similar model where we will have, we'll see globe structures across the city region, um, which are all part of an education program to kind of engage with local schools, communities and artists. And the purpose of it is to kind of, to kind of talk talk about the story of the enslavement period, but also before what happened um, before, you know, African people were enslaved and to tell them hidden histories and also come right up to the living day in terms of the legacy and impact of slavery. So this is gonna be a kind of a live outdoor trail starting in August next year through to October, covers the whole of the city region and the seven other cities across the country that are taking part in this. So, you know, really excited by, it. I think it's a real creative, way of us telling a story um, and engaging with people on this subject, which is really important. We also worked with the Cumbra Marnie Millennium Centre on doing some action research around business support. So the Near Black Business Hub did some work with Black and Asian and minority ethnic businesses. And what they uncovered was that there is significant demand for support that's untapped. People don't know where to go to access this support. There's a mistrust out there. So there's definitely a need for us to do some further work. We've got a report with a number of recommendations that we are reviewing at the moment and that will be taken forward. Um, we've continued to support the staff network. So the RISE staff network is for Black, Asian, minority ethnic staff in all the local authorities in the region and the combined authority. They continue to meet and they really have a focus on looking at progression and leadership and representation in their organisation. So we're supporting them with taking that work forward. 20 of them um, went on a, a pilot programme that John Moores did, a, a leadership programme, which was really positive and we got really good feedback. So you know, the, the scope for us to do more of that. And the business support working group that's been established by the Local Enterprise Partnership is looking at what the barriers are for black asian minority ethnic businesses they've just done a refresh of that group they've got more businesses on there more representatives and an independent chairperson to take forward that work so we'll be working very closely with them and looking at what comes out that needs to be taken forward and national museums liverpool have appointed the designers um, for the capital work on the international slavery museum they're going to be transforming the entrance to the museum and we've supported them with that work so that's going forward as well Next slide, please. The hub, which is the main kind of part of the investments that we went to the combined authority with this year is where we think we're gonna get real kind of, real change and real traction on reducing some of these inequalities um, that persist. I think what we found during the evidence gathering phase is that there'd been fragmented delivery of services, short-term funding, kinds of short-term interventions and services that were duplicating or competing with each other. So we wanna bring it together and have a strategic coordinated approach to this and have a central focused area where we can offer employment, business support, skills development and have that single point of reference. Um, we envisage that the hub will be an independent entity that will be established. It will commission and also deliver some services in house. Um, and I think some of the service it could deliver could be things like pre-recruitment support for individuals, support for businesses, um, support for organisations who want to diversify their workforces. Um, we need to focus on governance and leadership training so that we can get more representation um, on decision-making bodies. 
and I think also support with procurement and contract readiness for having more diverse supply chains. So I think there's a number of things that, that we think the hub could deliver, but we want to get um, a range of, of views on that. So we're appointing an independent panel and um, we've just been out to recruit board members who are going to come in and support us with the co-design and development business plan of how the hub will operate. I think we also want to make sure that we can test and learn and we can adapt. It may not always get it right first time. So I think, you know, being able to be flexible and try things out and doing a number of pilots to see what works is important. So we're hoping to start that in the new year, piloting a few areas and not being afraid to change if, if that doesn't work. Um, think the next slide please I think as part of the business case we've obviously looked at what we think the potential impact of, of, of the interventions that we're trying to put in place um, are going to have and overall it's you know it's quite high I think it's, it's suggesting that you know if we get all of these interventions right and if we close that employment gap in our city region which is around 15 percent at the moment um, we will achieve some some really good outcomes I think the training that we want to do will increase racial literacy across the city region um, and it could have a significant e economic output and um, estimated at around 300 million back into our economy every year if we close that employment gap as well as, as giving better career opportunities for our, our black asian minority ethnic residents and having more diverse workforces so that that's kind of the longer term goal of what we're trying to achieve with this but we're, we're kind of still in that mobilization phase i think it's fair to say next slide please so kind of the next steps in january the things that we're focusing on in terms of the racial literacy training and um, we will be going out to procure some training providers to work with our staff networks to design what that course will look like um, in terms of the development board, we will be announcing in January who them independent advisors are and start that co-design with communities and co-development co um, of the business plan and start piloting some activities. The Wild Reimagined, the arts project it will be going into schools in the new year. Um, a number of schools have already put themselves forward to participate in this across the region. And we'll be working with community partners as well and there's lots of local engagement as well to make sure that we tell our story in a way that we want to reflect the city region and we're continuing to do work internally as an employer we've got a number of things that we've done to try and increase um, the diversity of our workforce some basic things like where we advertise our, our vacancies we've introduced the Rooney rule for our senior level appointments to make sure we have a diverse short list um, we've introduced the, a guaranteed interview scheme for, for Black, Asian, minority ethnic applicants like we do for disabled um, applicants. And we're looking at getting more diverse recruitment panels set up as well going forward next year. So we've still got, we're still a way off that target um, and we know we've, we've got to do a lot more to diversify as a workforce. I think I'll leave it there. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation, Lorna, and clearly an awful lot of work has um, been going on, particularly since last year. And uh, um, I'm particularly interested in the work that you're doing with all of the other LCR um, local authorities. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Margaret Mick and Baroness Hooper had their hands up before and I forgot to bring them in. So if you guys would still like to ask a question, then I'm going to bring in Baroness Hooper first. Thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, uh, it was um, really in relation to what Sarah Atkinson had, had been talking about. And I wanted, um, uh, in fact, my two questions were really covered uh, subsequently, but uh, I wanted to agree fully about the need to coordinate um, uh, work which is going on, uh, and particularly uh, in the voluntary sector uh, and, and the encouragement of, of volunteers. And uh, I also wanted to congratulate Mo because the whole issue of sport for young people is so important. Uh, and the fact that Everton is doing this work uh, is giving a lead to other uh, organizations that could do something similar. Uh, I, I did have a slight question about um, apprenticeships and opportunities for apprenticeships in the region, which all ties in with the um, um, what's going on in, in terms of job opportunities and skills and so on. 
Um, but in, in a sense, I, I think those issues have been covered. So I wanted just to underline my agreement with those, those particular parts. Uh, and, and to say now to Lorna, uh, who's just spoken, I, I think that's the most fantastic program. Uh, and, and I do uh, hope um, that even if a few of the, the, those aims and projects come to fruition, um, it, it, it will cause an, an enormous uh, improvement. So thanks to um, Ravimbo and Leah as well uh, for what they've said. Um, but um, I think the whole idea of coordinating what's going on is, is um, key to, to getting a more comprehensive uh, 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 solution to all these things, which are all so intertwined anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Baroness Hobbit. Can um, Mick and Margaret um, raise their questions and then I'll get Sarah to respond to both of you. Thank you. Mick? Last year, I'd just like to uh, go back to uh, Rivimbo when she was talking about the lack of support uh, and the levelling up and uh, education and for BAME people. Uh, well, uh, just a question I'd ask is, who did she speak to? What organisations did she uh, contact? And uh, would it be worthwhile sitting down with myself uh, to have a conversation? Because I'm, I'm really interested in that, you know. Yeah, that would be amazing to do. I think the organisations I was then able to contact um where there were quite a lot of organisations I did contact within the rural, but the ones that managed to get back to me were Rural Change and Rural Dean Centre. So I was able to sit down with them um, because they are being read, but they also do um, just work with everyone within the, the rural. So it would be great. Yeah, we, it would be a wonderful to have that conversation with you. I think also because of the pandemic, it was really difficult for people to get back to me um, as well. So yeah, that'd be good. Yes, we and um, Margaret Brock. Thanks very much, um, Kim. And thank you to all of the speakers. Apologies, I was late arriving. So, Sarah, I do apologise because I missed the beginning of, of your, your speech. I think it's very impressive, you know, what's being set out here. And it, it raises all sorts of excitement around, you know, how change can be arrived at. I have um, a particular interest in particularly well in education because I used to be a teacher both in schools but also in adult skills in what was known as basic skills then we call them essential skills now and I think um, you know anything that I'd be interested whether there's any um, component around supporting people in in terms of having the opportunity to improve their skill sets from that level particularly literacy is a is a huge problem across the country um, and it, you know I used to be an adult literacy teacher and you know it's about creating opportunities in situations where people won't feel threatened at all and where barriers are removed to people's engagement in learning so I just wondered if there was anything maybe Lorna would have something to say about you know what's happening with that and I was also interested in the race equality hub whether that's going to be physically located in one place or whether it will kind of have a presence physically elsewhere because I think the point that was made um about I think Leah made the point about um things being within two miles of people I think it's incredibly important that people things are physically accessible um because public transport's expensive and also when you're talking about leveling up and wanting to you know help people improve their opportunity um having things close to home make it so much more easy for people and particularly for women actually because women bear the majority of the child um raising responsibilities and very often they're trying to juggle and fit things around what they can do so if you've got things in your community where you can pop down even if it was i'm, I'm preempting what your answer is going to be but if there's a hub somewhere if there could be outreach opportunities so that you know be physically present so in my constituency we have a place called the hull road hub and we have one called the carbridge center sort of community venues if there was an opportunity for there to be a presence there Obviously, I haven't asked them about this because I'm only just thinking about it. But, you know, just making it physically accessible to people, I think it's really important also because not everyone has the Internet as well. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Could I ask both um, Lorna and Sarah to keep their responses quite succinct, if that's possible, please? Thank you. Of course. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first and just very briefly on apprenticeships. I think it's a good example of what I talked about with the time 
targeting apprenticeships can be brilliant for social mobility and for disadvantaged people, but they won't be, and they aren't, without targeting and really measuring. At the moment, the best quality apprenticeships are going to the more privileged people because they understand how to navigate and access and succeed in them. So we've got to be really ruthless about having eyes on whether things are working for dis tackling disadvantage and inequality, rather than assuming that they will do because they can. Um, that was all I was going to say on those. I'll leave the, the others to others. Thanks, Sarah. Lorna? Yes, thank you. I mean, just to add to the apprenticeships question as well, I think we know that the, they're underrepresented. We're not getting you know, enough Black and Asian minority apprentices. So we think there's a wrapper of support that we need to put around that. And I think it comes back to Sarah's point on careers advice as well and support kind of in school. So that there's lots of work to be done on that. And we're expecting the hub to be able to help with that. To come back to the physical kind of location, yes, it will be a physical place. And I think you, you kind of preempted the answer in, in the sense of we think it'll be a hub and spoke. So we think there'll be, you know, probably a centralised location, but we would definitely need them outreach locations as well. So it's across the region and, and it's accessible to all. So, so that model hasn't been completely agreed on yet, but that's what we're thinking it's going to result in. Thanks for your questions and responses, everybody. I'm going to hand over to Steve Rotherham now. So, Steve, you've got about eight minutes. Thank you. Hopefully, I don't need eight minutes, uh, Chair, but uh, uh, we can free up some time. Just to, to say, um, we do a lot of these, don't we? You know, all, all the politicians on the call, we do a lot of these. And yet, I have to say, those two contributions by uh, Ravimbo and Leah are probably some of the most energetic and passionate and well thought through contributions um, that I've heard in a long time. And, and I thought I had some energy, but I'd like to harness uh, Ravimbo's energy and, and we could do an awful lot more. Look, what, what we obviously are trying to do here and, and, and work with um, the likes of Lorna Rogers is, is an absolute pleasure. We're, we're trying to disrupt to give a jolt to, to, to change, to fundamentally address lots of those institutionalized and um, systemic issues that we have about inequalities in the city region on a whole host of different things, but specifically we know around uh, the sort of, of, of racism that we know um, exists uh, around the, uh, the unfairness of the way in which things are distributed, including our own funding, um, about how we can harness the full potential of, of everything that we have here. So we're, we're doing stuff to have a look at this in the right way so that we are not making pre, we're not prejudging the outcomes. We're, we're, we're genuinely in a consultative um, framework where people then can look at, for instance, some of the things that have come up today about a hub and a spoke and on all those things. So we're very much still open to um, to be influenced. Please let us know um, what we need to do. It, it goes far beyond this. I think we just touched on, for instance, about public transport. But in public transport, for instance, we have the most generous concessionary travel scheme in the whole country. And it's still not enough because there are parts of our communities that can't even afford the £2.20 if you're a young person or the reduced rates that we've got in other areas and even our apprenticeships we give them um half price travel for for our apprenticeships in the city region which is not available in other places and we know it's not enough but if it's all about leveling up then we need to level up in our own city region as well as trying to encourage central governments to genuinely level up the country now i, I agree with you chair um it's a sound bite isn't it it's not really happening we've seen it a million times we've seen the way in which announcements are made we've seen for instance over the last few weeks about what's called the ipr the um the rail plan the integrated rail plan for the north and the fact that that leaves us behind so there's so many aspects of this that we haven't touched on but perhaps in the future chair you might want to come back and, and we can debate some of those individual issues 
Thank you so much, um, Steve. Well, that kind of maybe um, is a good segue in because Steve um, Barwick will be talking about proposed um, programme for 2022 shortly. But I just wanted to ask if anybody had any questions before we move on to Steve's um, Barwick's presentation. I can't see any hands at the moment. So no questions for Lorna or Steve. I'm just double checking because um, I can't get everybody on the screen at the same time. So bear with me. And there's nothing no. in the chat box. So sorry, did someone say something? No, I was just going to say I can't see any hands up. OK, then, Steve. Well, that is a good segue then, Steve for you then to talk about what happened in 2021 and what's proposed for 2022 as the Secretariat for the LCR APPG. Thank you, over to you. Yeah, thanks Kim. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks everybody else. Uh, I think it's been a really great meeting actually and uh, really important that uh, these issues are on the agenda. Um, I just wanted to quickly, everybody's seen a paper so I won't go through every word um, you'll have seen it and um, but just to say a few things about 2021 I mean been fantastic in terms of you know we've had regular meetings we've had seven in total really good attendance we know how busy MPs are uh, and uh, peers of course as well Baroness Hooper um, who's been a, a stalwart this year thank you um, and also we know how busy you are, Steve uh, Rotherham, uh, but it's been very good attendance, almost 50% of the MPs or, or their staff are on most of the calls, uh, and um, we've ended up with a really good uh, series of meetings, uh, and we actually uh, compiled and launched a report, uh, Level Up, Recover and Deliver Clean, Green and Inclusive Growth, which was um, uh, very much assisted by uh, the Heseltine Institute uh, academics. Uh, and I think a couple of those are on the call, should say thanks to them, James and Tom. I know Sue Jarvis couldn't be here today. So I think it's been a really great collaborative effort. That report um, has led to a series of letters, one of which actually was to the education secretary about some of the education recommendations. Well, there was one to the transport secretary i know steve's disappointed with the irp um uh, and as we all are uh, but basically you know there is some kind of room for hopefully dialogue and when we start to look at next year obviously obviously we are going to come back to the themes that were in that report uh, that, that we launched so net zero growth infrastructure housing and transport and of course skills and innovation so and i think the um sort of you know whether we like it or not not quite sure that's the right way of saying it but i think that basically leveling up is going to be the dominant theme uh of 2022 we are now expecting a white paper i think somebody's rumored the 10th of january but that might get pushed back again because of uh Omicron, um, but who knows, but it is going to come out in the new year and it clearly is going to frame a lot of people's discussions. And so the plan and the proposed plan is to have a series of meetings that kind of do what I think somebody mentioned earlier, which is to look in depth at some of these key issues. So what, what does levelling up really mean for transport? What does it mean for prosperity? What does it mean for housing? What does it mean for innovation and R&D? Uh, so I think we've, I, I won't go through, as I say, everything that's in the paper, but there's a whole, it's quite an ambitious programme, I have to say. Um, and it is only made possible because of the fact that people like the housing associations and United Utilities and the other sponsors uh, can kind of uh, make that, make these meetings happen. But I think there's a a, a, an outline of seven meetings and what we want to do in this coming year is very much work as we have this year with the combined authority uh, and I understand um, from conversations uh, with the combined authority that uh, they are planning their own submission to the levelling up uh, so a levelling up deal and so the idea is that we will assist in informing that uh, obviously that will be there report but hopefully we would be able to uh, see the fruits of that at the end of the year and launch 
uh, or help launch that. So the basic programme is before you. And just one final caveat, as always with everything in politics, um, things uh, sometimes get blown off course by events. There might be a need to have emergency meetings about particular subjects. We did say that we wanted to come back to social care. Uh, obviously, the uh, ICS agenda is quite important. So there will be some wriggle room, but it's just a sort of outline provisional programme, which obviously, if anybody's got any questions about, very happy to answer those. But hopefully we can move forward on that basis. Thanks very much, Dave. And you're quite right in terms of um, the seven proposed meetings for next year, quite ambitious, but I do look forward to seeing them come to fruition. I can't see any hands up and I can't, um, there's nothing in the chat box either at this moment in time. So that just leaves me to ask participant, participants if people are happy to agree um, provisionally the programme in principle. I mean, just maybe nod heads and I've stuff. And nods. Just <laughs> nods. So I take that that has been agreed. So thank you very much. And thank you, Steve, for um, all the hard work that you've put in along with your um, colleagues in terms of putting forward the, the programme. So thanks very much. Yep. Thank you. Good. OK. OK. So the next item on the agenda is agreeing the APP representative on the Liverpool Free Board. Uh, and uh, again, a I think a paper was circulated. I think it's been on the agenda a couple of times. And, and I think what has been discussed is that both Mick Whitley and myself will um, job share the, the post on the board, but we'll just have um, one vote. And if people are happy for us to, um, to agree that, that, then that will be um, what we'll go ahead with. So if anybody has any comments on any of the information that's been circulated previously about the free port, please put your hand up or put something in the chat box. I can see a thumb going up um, from Margaret. <laughs> so is that? That was me just saying yes, good idea. About the <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. So um, if there's no other comments, I will take that as uh, an agreement that Mick Whitley and myself, Kim Johnson, will be the reps on the Free Port Board. And hopefully in um, the future, we'll be looking at um, how the unions can take a role on that board as well. But thank you. But um, we've come to the end of, no, we haven't. <laughs> I was going to say we've come to the end of the agenda, but we haven't, you know, but um, so I would like to ask each of our contributors um, what they think the sh government should do to truly level up inequalities in the city region. So I'm going to start in the order in which we had the speaker. So I'm going to ask Sarah first you know, as briefly as possible, what you think the government should do to truly level up inequalities in our city region. Thank you, Sarah. I'd put two things on my wish list. The first is extending pupil premium to 16 to 18 year olds to make a difference to keep young people supported in education and in opportunities. The second is I'd love to see the benefits of a mentoring programme that we know our students benefit from rolled out across the city region that a mentor can be transformative for young people, whether they're struggling to stay in education and training at all, or whether they've got the potential to really achieve in education, a mentor can be transformative. So I'd love to see a national programme of mentoring. And I think Liverpool will be a fantastic place at that. Thanks very much, Sarah. I might put those um, suggestions forward to the House of Commons Education Select Committee. Thank you. And um, Ravimbo, what do you think this government needs to do? I think this government needs to focus on, I know it's difficult to change the educational 
educational curriculum within you know a short amount of time but I think you really need to look into investing in people that can come into schools and teach young people about the history and culture because like I said it takes a village to raise a child and what young people are learning in school is what they carry on to adulthood so if there's ignorance that's been taught because of what's in the curriculum they're going to carry that on into adulthood so I would really focus on investing in freelancers or people that can come in and teach young people about African history Asian history but the the real history not the history that's been colonized but decolonizing the history thank you so much for those contributions remember you know so education curriculum to be far more flexible in mm -hmm. how it um, delivers education to young people thank you and leah the same question to you Thank you. Uh, my list would be quite aspirational, but if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, and mine would be about the youth provision, having a stable um, youth provision that's guaranteed um, across local authorities. Um, I think a better mental health system that's more youth led um, and shaped um, and functions a bit better to the needs of young people. And then I think finally, sort of linking into what's been said um, about having space planned on the curriculum for those types of things, for those life skills, for those decolonized curriculum, sort of things like that, that really help, you know, to shape culturally um, and achieve sort of what we want to achieve um, in addressing inequalities. Thank you so much, Leah. And I'd just like to reiterate what Steve said about the contributions to from the two young people in today's meeting. I think it's really important that we, as um, politicians and practitioners hear directly from young people, you know, the issues that affect them on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, so it's really important. Thank you, um, Leah and Lorna, the same question to you, please. Thank you. Um, I suppose building on what other people have said, I I'd like to see investment into people, into education, health, skills, and um, all of that needs more investment. And I think empowering local communities to come up with local solutions because it can't be a one-size-fits-all we've all got different challenges um, across the country and I think also we need to be incentivizing large corporations to locate in our region as well so we're creating good quality jobs for our, our young people. Thank you so much Lorna and um, yeah wish lists great don't ask don't get and um, Steve Rotherham. Thanks Chair. Um, I'll go back to what was said earlier about skills. I, I think skills is probably the most important issue. So if we could get some apprenticeship levy funding devolved to the Liverpool City region, we can give hope to our young people. But on a, a sort of more macro level, I was with the German um, ambassador the other day uh, who came over for the G7. And he could not believe that we have to go into competitive rounds for every pot of funding that we eventually hopefully access. So to have some core funding from central government so that we don't have to go with the charade, through the charade of a beauty contest every time they announce a pot of money, that would be my big ask. Thank you, Steve. And as we know, we're not playing on a level playing field when it comes to um, the competitive um, process either, are we? Steve Barwick, I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask you the same question. Thank you. On the levelling up? Yes. Um, oh, the last, uh, thank you. Um, well, I think that, uh, I think we do need to just kind of, what I'd like to see is some detail rather than mm -hmm. words, I suppose. That's my wish. So uh -huh. I want to see more specific projects we want to see some proper funding, like Steve uh, Rotherham has said, it needs to be devolved so that actually uh, the combined authority can get on with doing the job that it's really there and capable of doing, which is sorting out and really progressing these issues rather than having to spend a tremendous amount of time uh, liaising with government or, uh, you know, and reporting back, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's it. I'm, I'm concerned that the levelling up white paper is saying that it's not going to come with any extra funding at all. There have been rumours to that effect. So, yeah, we need to see detail. We want specifics and um, we need to actually be able to get on with the job in 2022 to really make a bit of a difference. So, yeah, that'd be my answer. Thank you for your contributions, Steve. And yes, actions do speak louder than words, don't they? So um, I would just like to conclude the meeting by thanking all the speakers 
the sponsors of the group, the secretariat and all participants for joining today. And I'd like to wish everyone a happy, healthy and safe seasoned greetings and a very happy 2022 to everybody. And I do hope you get to see your family, your loved ones. And, and I hope to see you all again in the new year. So all please take care of yourself and thanks for coming today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks very much, everyone.